You are listening to SPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Welcome to Scuderia F1, the podcast that's always up to speed with the latest Formula One news. Follow us on Twitter at Scuderia F1 Pod and subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Daly and Kevin Laramay. Hey guys, welcome to the show this evening. Mark Daly and Kevin Laramay here. Kevin, we are on the eve of another very busy uh, weekend in motorsports, Hungarian Grand Prix and the Montreal E-Prix go this weekend. So the two of us are going to be very, very busy watching and reporting on all of those. But uh, welcome to the show. And we've got plenty to talk about before Formula One heads into the summer break after this weekend. And I have to admit, as much as I love the summer, I'm not a big fan of Formula One's summer holiday yeah it gives us a, a few free weekends but uh it, it does make a big like hole in the season it does drag the season maybe a little longer than it should be dragged on so there's that aspect but i am excited mark this weekend is a big weekend for me my first formula e grand well e pre in montreal it's a double race two races saturday sunday the fun starts to uh, well Today, when you're listening to this show on Friday, you can, uh, well, it's not open to the public, but the media has a, a few events at the circuit. We'll be able to talk to the drivers tomorrow at noon and get a sense of uh, their anticipation. A lot of drivers, we'll talk about this in the Formula E segment, but the drivers are really getting excited about the actual circuit itself. This is the most interesting circuit of the entire season so far that will test those electric cars and, and that excites me but on top of it the Hungarian Grand, Hungarian Grand Prix this weekend a lot of news in the world of F1 motorsports it's a packed show tonight it is and did you notice that uh, when we were putting the show notes together over the past couple of days that there's a couple of underlying themes so one of them is uh, all the news that's going on in Formula E but Formula One is a lot to do with a lot of these guys that will be testing for the various teams over the next uh, week or so after the uh, Hungarian Grand Prix wraps up and they do the the test session there but also it's it's the same thing in Formula One it's it's all about engines at the moment engines and the hay Halo. And the Halo, of course, made big news last week after Formula One pushed through, or not Formula One, but the FIA pushed through the Halo on safety grounds that will be introduced in 2018. And this has been an extremely unpopular decision uh, everywhere from fans to pundits to drivers to basically anybody that likes Formula One. Nikki Lauda from Mercedes even said that the Halo destroys the DNA of a Formula One car. So I don't think that there's any more of a damning description <laughs> that, that you could get with that. I mean, I think Nikki really nailed it right on the head with that comment. No, for sure. And let's face it, we're not against the idea of more protection for drivers. We're not against any idea to find a solution to give drivers what's known now as a like a last line of defense between incoming objects and their helmets, right? That's the actual idea of the halo or the visor or the windshield that was tested a few weeks ago by Sebastian Vettel. And the results of those tested are directly correlated to now the halo being officialized for next year because while well, the test of the shield did not go well there was a smudge that kept on coming on the windshield and because of the angle of it everything was a bit distorted and Vettel thought it was difficult to drive yes the halo is not perfect it actually impedes the vision of the drivers too and it's less very less than an ideal situation but in the words of Fernando Alonso and Sebastian Vettel the death of Justin Wilson could have been avoided with something similar to that so you do have very, very, very big arguments for something similar to the Halo. Is the Halo the best option? No. Does it make the car look like a sandal? Like a flip-flop? Yes. Will it be difficult for everybody to adjust and see just F1 with it next year? Yes. But we do have to agree with the principle of finding ways to protect the drivers. 
Yeah, absolutely. And the FIA has said in the past day or so that they do expect the final design will be more pleasing to look at. So how they're going to manage to pull that one off, that remains to be seen. But I, I guess that is one positive. And, and I do agree. I mean, I'm all for more safety for the drivers. It's just that I think that the that the Halo is a very unattractive and a, a rather ugly option that uh, that they've decided to go with. And, and uh, Lauda himself even said that there were several better options that they could have used. But the aero screen, like you said, Vettel said it made him dizzy and it got smudged and everything. I mean, you think just to, just driving down the road in summer in your own car, how dirty your windscreen gets. Yeah, so imagine and, if it rains. Imagine yeah. when there'll be an oil spill on the track. Exactly. And, and, and now you can't see anything because of your windshield. And yes, of course, windshield will have peel aways on them, just like the helmets, right? If you watch Le Mans Endurance Racing, you know that like windshield have four or five pull aways and you can take them away, remove all the bugs, because in Lama you have a lot of bugs, you actually go through forests, right? But in Formula One, you would have smudge, you would have uh, residue hitting the windshield, creating like a cut in the actual plastic of the peel away, making a smudge. So yes, the halo is a way to protect the drivers. And you know what it reminds me of, Mark? If you know if there's hockey players listening to this show, but we all have like, if you, you play hockey any time in your life, there's different type of face mask, right? You have either like the the the, the, sh- the the screen windshield, or you have like the bars, and the bars yeah. are really fun because there's no smog and they never get fogged up and it protects you, but you can't really see everything. With the visor, you see well, but there's fog and there's smog and there's smidges on it. So, uh, which one is best? And that's almost the same conundrum with the F1 cars. I think. The Halo would probably, like you mentioned, a more aesthetic version, but a more as well, probably thinner middle part and a little higher as well to permit vision. So it will be a little different than one we saw months ago, but still, it is not the ideal situation. I think down the road, maybe even a closed cockpit is the idea to go a la endurance with peelaways on it, but we're still a long, long ways from it. Yeah, interesting that you should uh, should say that. But I was just thinking as you were talking about hockey, I was just wondering who is the Craig McTavish of Formula One? Not only did Craig not wear the helmet or the visor, he was like really old school. I don't think that guy ever wore a helmet the entire time he, he played the at the NHL. Yeah. Yes, if you don't know in uh, hockey, he was the last player not to wear a hockey helmet because when he introduced the rules in the late 80s, early 90s, it was grandfather then. So whichever player was already playing could still not have a helmet every new player coming into the league had to wear a helmet and it was the last one of those type of players so for years and years we saw craig mctavish was his his luscious curly gray hair not wearing a helmet (laughs) but no it's interesting where how will it be perceived now because there's there's two sides young drivers max verstappen are against it they're like no no it's not going to help When you have actual veteran like Fernando Alonso and Sebastian Vettel saying, well, we kind of need it, so it is what it is. Well, that's right. And uh, I know that they made some uh, some uh, examples or some reasons uh, for some of the different incidents that have happened over the years. And they did mention, uh, when was it, 2009, 2010, when Felipe Massa got hit in the, in, in the, in the visor with that, was it a piece of suspension or whatever that flew off one of the other cars? Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah. That, that's a sign, right? What, what could have been? What if that was a bigger piece of a rim or something, right? It was lucky that yeah. it was small enough that there was no injuries more than just a concussion. Exactly, because I mean, that could have been uh, very, very scary. I mean, it was very scary, but it could have been a a, a lot, lot worse. So, I mean, there are a lot of sad and and tragic precedents out there. So, I mean, be a decapitation mark. I'm extreme here, but we're talking with the speeds we're talking about and with weight of object. Imagine if a wheel comes flying at you while you're at 230, 100 miles an hour going a straightaway. Well, guess what? It's physics, right? So, no, we. It is needed, and you you do. There is instant in the last decade of drivers losing their life, dying, and getting injured, and that halo would have prevented those situations. So that's where you kind of can't necessarily disagree with it. But let's hope they actually do it right, the engineers, when they design it. Because it's one thing to design something to test an idea, it's one thing to actually design something that everybody will agree and has to agree. 
that will be implemented next year. Yes, absolutely. So let's move now from the halo to Formula One engine news. There's a lot of news uh, with uh, with engines and power units. Christian Horner said that Formula One must get their priorities right with the 2021 engines. So basically, I think what they want to do is they want to strike a balance between, I, I guess, costs, uh, louder and powerful engines. Because I mean, obviously, the, the hybrid V6 turbos that we've had now for the past several years are phenomenal technology. I mean, there's nothing short of the I mean, they're just amazing, <laughs> but I mean, they don't sound like Formula One engines. So the the current formula is up in 2020. So we're going to have it for a couple of more years. So they're looking at discussing what is going to happen beyond that. Are they going to keep the, the, the hybrid V6 turbos? Is there going to be some development on that? Or are they going to go in a completely different direction? So I, I think it's interesting, too, that, that, that Red Bull always seems to be around in these discussions because they haven't been happy with the engines that they've had for the past couple of years. And so I guess that is part of it, but it, it is interesting. And when you see some of the names that are coming up now that are expressing interest, because th- you know, over the past, say, six or seven months, especially before the season started, and uh, especially after the Liberty Media takeover was announced, there were a lot of manufacturers that said right from the beginning that there was no interest, that they didn't want to come back into Formula One. But now all of a sudden you do get some some different names popping up. You have, have Ilmore saying that they're looking for a partner for a 2021 F1 Formula or sorry, Formula One engine project, Aston Martin. So there are different people there. I think I even heard that Cosworth were, and Ford were thinking about coming back into Formula One. So now that you see the Liberty Media like takeover in effect and you see what's going on, and it's interesting to see these companies looking at uh, two, three, four years down the road. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds over the next, well, n- maybe not months, but uh, until they get this new agreement sorted out. Yeah, and it's the idea as well of, look, it's all well and good development at pushing the hybrid technology engines and engines and V6 turbos to its full potential. But we want to bring back the essence of racing back into Formula One as well, right? And if you're looking at series that actually have amazing races or battles, and it's not about necessarily the, the most amount of technology or the, 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 the most fine-tuned hybrid engine. It's about sometimes just a powerful engine and don't overcomplicate the situation. So Formula One will have a crossroad, and maybe it's 2021, where they have to choose bef- between going, continuing to going to the hybrid semi-electric, semi-combustion engine type of cars or just fully combustion engine or maybe fully electric even 15 years on the road, right? So there will be those crossroads and they have to decide what is Formula One? What is Formula One in 2017, 18, 2021? What is our goal? Our goal is it to make the fastest cars combustion engine possible because we could do that and we could do probably very efficient fuel, very fuel efficient cars with technology, whatever, or we can go, right? So there will be decisions and directions needed to be taken in the next few years. And that's where I think it's important too, because you want to have competitive races and decisions in the boardroom about how your engines should be. Well, it reflects on the track and you want to be competitive. So I think this should be taken into consideration before decisions are made. Yeah, and it's also interesting, too, because there's always this comment that they they want to strike that balance between racing and entertainment and the relevance to road technology. And I, I think out of everything, I think the relevance to road technology isn't really quite as high up on the list for me. I mean, I think it's cool that I have traction control in my car, and it obviously yeah, it helps the, a lot of the winter. But that's I 20 mean, years what, ago, though, Mark, right? That's 30 years yeah. ago. And I think now the road technology has come to a certain part of of the crossroads where there's not much more to be learned at a certain point, right? <laughs> we understand how it works. Now it's different parts of different type of technology that we're making breakthroughs through racing. And that's where we eventually we'll talk about Formula E. And that's where I, manufacturers are, are making big decisions by going into this series to, to learn more about electric racing. So, no, I understand why... Back in the day, it was important for traction control, anti-blocking brakes, and and uh, like 
steering and shifting on the battle wheels and stuff like that that were all out of racing. But now it's not necessarily the case anymore. It's been a long time, too. If you listen to engineers, it's been a long time that a technology developed in F1 has been able to be compatible with road races. It's closer to space engineering, Formula One, than road car drivers. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's great to get some of these uh, technologies in your car. But like you say, what actually gets into the car that you buy on the lot and take home and drive to and from work and to wherever each and every day is uh, completely different and obviously going to be a very different type of the technology that they uh, they use in the uh, in, in Formula One. I mean, it takes a long time to get here and it's got a completely different application to it. But it, it is interesting to see all the different things that are, that are happening in the racing world. And not only <laughs> do we have um, different manufacturers, engine manufacturers, that is, expressing interest to come into Formula One, there's been other news in the past couple of days that the deal between Honda and Sauber for 2018 is it's off it is uh, not going to happen wow. yeah know, that- it's crazy <laughs> and if you read the article too it's interesting where you hear Mr. Vassar talking about how he's been yep. working on this for 10 days and how it's basically said that when Honda's like look my predecessor started talking to you about eight months ago and last eight months on your side not necessarily the most glorious last eight months on my side not necessarily the most glorious. How about we each work on the, uh, on each other? Like, it's not you, it's me. And uh, we'll both work on each other a little bit. And maybe some point down the road, we'll do business. But let's uh, not be partners for 2018. Yeah. And well, I mean, I, I guess you couldn't really sit, be too surprised, but uh, I, I think it, you know, to a certain degree, it is surprising, but there are some other options for Sauber out there for, for 2018. And uh, they're, they're saying that they want to have an engine deal wrapped up in time for the, the beginning of the summer break. So when you think about that, I mean, that only leaves them about four or five days to, to get that sorted out. So who are they talking to? Are they talking to Mercedes? Are they talking to Renault? Are they talking well, to Ferrari. Apparently it's Who, Ferrari though, because that's the deal they have now, but they have yes. last year's spec. And if exactly. you're looking at last year's spec, we've talked to this about like a few weeks ago on the show. Ferrari's last year's specs are not even built for tires and the size of the tires of this year, right? It's not even made for this those type of cars. So there's a big difference and maybe they're trying to get a better deal with Ferrari because the one thing though that is probably the biggest reason why Sauber and Honda uh, as like the deal fell through is next year Sauber would have had to use the gearbox of McLaren to fit the Honda engine. So Sauber now uses the Ferrari gearbox and Sauber will not be in a position next year to create their own gearbox. So they have to find a deal that includes the engine and the gearbox. So maybe they find a while, they're trying to find a way to put pressure on Ferrari to have a better deal. Maybe Mercedes will be a supplier engine or who knows, maybe they'll find a way to get a Renault engine next year. But outside of those three possibilities, I don't think there's even like that's all there is, right? That's all the engine suppliers right there if you take on the out of the equation. Yeah, and it's interesting too when you think what's going to happen with uh, with McLaren. What are they going to do for 2018? Because that just seems to be the like the constant saga in Formula One. It's just what's going to happen each and every week, and then when the inevitable happens, and one of their power units lets them down, one or both of the cars uh, have engine problems. You just wonder, okay, well, is this the week that they just blow it all up and uh, make an announcement they're they're going with a different uh, different power unit, different manufacturer for 2018 and beyond? But it's 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 funny because I, I believe that uh, Mercedes even ruled out uh, the possibility of an engine deal for McLaren in 2018. So as time goes on, it kind of makes me wonder: are are they just going to be, <laughs> be stuck with each other? Yeah, they're going to be stuck with each other just because there isn't any other option out <laughs> there. Because you use know, the I, same uh, analogy, Mark. There's no rebound possible, so they're going to stick <laughs> with the same partner for next year. Well, I mean, we're we're already at the end of July here, Kevin. I mean, the development for the cars for 2018 is well underway. And the longer that it takes McLaren to sort out what they're going to do with the, you know, which which engine is going to go on the back of their car for 2018, that's not something that you can reach a deal with in December. Because I mean, by that point, I mean, the cars are going to be pretty much done. Because, you you know, it's only in February when they start testing for for the new season. So whatever they're doing, they're doing it right now. And 
and a- anything like each and every day and week that gets wasted uh, w- when it comes to making a choice is just time that is spent going down the wrong path and you know I- incurring like a-, a lot of expense and a lot of time to-, to to redesign it to fit something else so just from from that point of view makes me think that each and every week that it drags on that's it's, it's just seems logical that McLaren and Honda will be back together again in 2018. It certainly looks that way. It would make a lot of sense. And if you're McLaren, you're doing your best with the car, but you you, you do see progression over the last few months, right? And uh, it's looking at other options. What are the costs of switching? What are the costs of uh, the buyout clause? How much would it cost? Is it actually worth it? Financially, could it make actually more sense to just keep on keeping on with Honda and hope for the best once again for next year? Figure out your contract and driver situation. Maybe you go save money and not resign really Alonso and get another kid and just brace for impact for two years ago again, right? I don't know, but what other option are they? Mercedes engine? Maybe, but for that, a decision needs to be taken ASAP. And it's been quiet over the last two weeks concerning Honda and McLaren compared to the few months before. So does it say that it's either a conclusion on one side or other? I don't know. But usually when there's something that's really talked about and then it becomes silent because the conclusion is close. So we will have, I think, a resolution to this debate very soon will mclaren stay with honda for next year but all signs point to yes yeah and it also makes you wonder like you say will fernando alonso be back at uh, mclaren for next year because i think he's asking in the neighborhood of what about 40 million a year u.s that's a Something lot of money like that. that you can save when you <laughs> just maybe get one that you don't even have to pay more than like a million so i don't know i'm just throwing a name out there and that might be way way out of line but okay here, here's a scenario. They break the contract one on the find a way to get Mercedes engine. And, oh, you need a driver? Oh, Esteban Ocon. Maybe goes for McLaren or something like that. I don't know. Maybe maybe uh, that's a possibility there. Yeah. And also, if you look at a lot of the names that are going around, there are a lot of guys that will be doing tests next week. I mean, you look at uh, McLaren is going to do, to be giving a shot to uh, Formula Three star Lando Norris. Oliver Rowland is going to get a chance to drive uh, Renault. Robert Kubica is also going to drive for Renault. Although Renault has uh, said that um, pretty much uh, Julian Palmer will be back after the summer break and that there and there's even sort of stories coming out and rumors that uh, that that there's there isn't a chance that uh, Kubica will be in the car, but you look at also a lot of the names. Uh, Luca Giotto is going to be driving for Williams. Uh, Matsushita is going to test for Sauber, and uh, the list goes on. Charles Leclerc is going to be driving for Ferrari, and I mean the list goes on. There are going to be a lot of these um, young up and coming drivers that are going to be testing uh, next week. So, could we see some of them in a car for next year? That's a, a great question. We had a, a tweet from the Formula E geek, and uh, his question, or maybe a comment, was how long before Charles Leclerc gets a ra- race seat in Formula One? And based on his record over the past couple of years well maybe it's not going to be too much longer before he gets his shot so i mean getting a big test with the ferrari that's 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 something in and of itself and (laughs) And of course might have a vacant seat next year too massa might finally retire 12 months later and a seat might be open in a powerful team with a very good engine right so going to be a lot of movement i think in drivers in the next few weeks because even verstappen and red bull max's father yos is putting pressure now on red bull to develop to deliver a race winning car because he feels max has the talent right now to be winning races well, that's very true. And the team that I'm really looking at uh, right now is Ferrari because ni- neither of their drivers are under contract for, for 2018. Although Sebastian Vettel said uh, a couple of days ago that there's no rush and there's no, there, there's no problem there and there, there's no real urgency on either his part or the team to get a deal done. And all indications is that something's going to happen at some point. So I, I would think that unless something 
really outrageous happens. I, I couldn't uh, imagine Sebastian Vettel not driving for Ferrari next year. But as we've talked about, basically, I think since the inception of this podcast way back in 2016, is Kimi Raikkonen. I, I, I don't know about you, Kevin, but I just find it hard to believe, especially with a lot of the criticism from Sergio Marchionne, the, the president of uh, Ferrari, that, uh, that, that Raikkonen will be back next year. I, I just can't see it. I mean, the age, his performances this year, I mean, even Raikkonen has uh, admitted in the, the, the past couple of days that his performances in the car this year haven't been up to scratch. And uh, also, I'm sure that uh, being the guy that he is, that uh, he's also asking quite a big paycheck. So who is going to be that guy in that number two Ferrari? But my money is it's going to be somebody else other than Kimi Raikkonen for 2018. I mean, that might be a bit of a an obvious statement, but <laughs> I'm going to say it anyways. No, what what does Kimi has left to prove? Why? Not a lot. No, exactly. Why is he risking that much every single weekend that he races? Why? why? What's his motivation? Meh. Exactly. And over the last few weeks, we've seen this. And Yes, he had performed well in qualification. He has some decent results in the last few months and has kind of turned his season kind of around. And, but if you're looking at the team perspective, what Ferrari really wants is a constructor championship. It's been since, what, 1999, 2000? Then win one? And because of Kimi's lackluster performances, Mercedes got an advantage in the driver's ten and the, uh, the constructor champion. So there's that aspect to it. Do you need someone to push Vettel? And we know that Vettel has usually in his contract kind of like a say in who his teammate will be. So until Vettel's situation is resolved, I don't think we'll know who his teammate will be because I have a feeling he's going to say yeah or nay. And does Vettel really want to be pushed by Everstappen? Does Vettel really want to be pushed by Ricciardo? Does Vettel really want to be pushed by, I don't know, let's go with other potential ideas, a a science getting a chance finally or something like that? It's a good question. And I think Vettel wants to be the number one driver wherever he is. And the less competition in especially younger ones, I think, is the best for for him and his point of view. So I don't necessarily dismiss the very old rumor of Verstappen going to Ferrari, but I think Vettel wouldn't necessarily be happy about it. Yeah, that that's a very good point that you raise. And also what you were saying just now about Carlos Sainz is uh, an interesting situation because he's getting a little bit impatient at Toro Rosso and he figures that he should be moving up to a bigger team. Uh, although Toro Rosso have basically confirmed that they're going to be b- bringing him back as well as Daniil Kvyat for 2018. But they've also said that they're open to offers if anybody wants to come in and break that contract and move him on to another team. So who would be interested is that would would possibly a, a Renault be interested? Would, say, McLaren be interested if uh, Fernando Alonso comes back? But then you'd have two fairly young drivers in Sainz and Van Dorn, so that that's a bit of a question mark. Or would he be, say, a fit as a number two at Ferrari, like you say, Vettel obviously wouldn't be too comfortable having another top-ranked driver as his uh, as his teammate, and obviously we've seen recently him go wheel to wheel with Max Verstappen, and obviously that I, I don't know that, I, or obviously I think that would raise a lot of uh, nerves at Ferrari if they were going going at it on the track if they're both racing for the team. So it's that that'll be something to watch because the other thing is too that Ferrari typically don't tend to give too many opportunities to very young drivers but as we've seen with Verstappen he obviously is quick he's exceptionally talented would they be willing to do that would they be willing to take that risk and and get a guy like Max Verstappen in the team so it's interesting it's, too because when you look at uh, Mercedes right what made them a powerful team in the last few years too is having two drivers battling each other and pushing the car to make the car better at the end of the year and that's something that's actually necessary I think to have two drivers wanting to win in the same team to make that actual that, that entire team better, and we've seen this happen with Mercedes, and I think we can see it happen with Ferrari if you put someone in that second seat that actually will push that car, actually will push Vettel, that will maybe think 
a little differently and have a different way to drive that car to maybe see and discover different things about that car. So am I saying that Kimi drives the same as Vettel? No, but it's still a different generation. What if you put a new Wonder Kid in there? See what happens. Maybe, maybe that's what Ferrari needs, right? That new generation, that enthusiasm, that breath of fresh air that we saw Verstappen bring to Red Bull mid-season last year in Barcelona and winning his first ever Grand Prix for Red Bull. Uh, that was a breath of fresh air. So maybe that's what Ferrari needs to finally break that glass ceiling because, let's face it, Mark, they're second behind Mercedes once again this year. Yeah, and that ties in very nicely to a tweet that we had from Jonathan Zavarella. And his question uh, was, or a comment is, a good topic to discuss would be the development race between Mercedes and Ferrari and how Mercedes is now clearly winning that race. And I, I think definitely since uh, Monaco that it, uh, it, it, it switched around. So <laughs> what's going to happen this weekend in, in Hungary is going to be, uh, it, it's going to be, I think, a very important race uh, for both of them. I mean, they, they've obviously with, uh, with, uh, Valtteri Bottas slowly coming on and quietly inserting himself into the championship uh, discussion between uh, Hamilton and uh, and Vettel. I mean, he has a realistic shot now. And uh, what with him uh, scoring race wins and and podiums all the time, that uh, Mercedes is now pulled away in the the Constructors' Championship. So, and, And I think that Monaco for Mercedes, as painful it was for them a couple of months ago, was absolutely necessary because up until that point, it was Ferrari season. They were doing much better than uh, Mercedes, but they went back to the, the the factory at Brackley and they put in all the work and basically kept everything running for 24-7. And since then, when they went to to, uh, to Canada, when they went to, uh, to, to, to Spain, to Azerbaijan, et cetera, et cetera, it definitely has been very much uh, Mercedes. I know there's been a, a couple of times where, like at, the, at, uh, at Austria, even though uh, Botas won, that uh, Vettel was pushing him right at the end, and that was a bit of an off weekend with Hamilton, what with the, uh, the gearbox change and all those sorts of things. But they definitely have been just that little bit better than Ferrari over the past four or five races. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. But I still feel like the Mercedes was best all along and was just not necessarily fine-tuned and not necessarily known enough about this beast to yeah. tame it correctly. And now it has. Now it's known. And I think Hamilton and Bottas will be dangerous. In Hungary, one fact this year is both Vettel and... Hamilton were not able to win back-to-back races this year so far. And I think that explains why the driver's title is so close still, even though we've seen Hamilton quite getting an advantage lately because of outside interference being penalties and grid penalties and car failures and stuff. The results are not reflecting this. But if it wasn't for gear penalties, and which like turn into grid penalties... Hamilton will be first in the driver's standings. So I think Hamilton is the favorite now. And I think, well, unless Ferrari changes their their development perspective over the last few weeks, I do feel Hamilton is the heavy favorite heading into Hungary and for the rest of the season. Well, definitely going into Hungary because Lewis has won that race five times. So... You have to think that he's going to be odds on favorites to win it again because I mean, Hungary, even though it's set out in the country, it, it's basically the same as Monaco. It's a street circuit just without the streets <laughs> and the buildings. I mean, it's not really a track for passing. I mean, it's a, it's very twisty and technical in places. So whoever basically is going to get into that first corner, it's really going to go a long way in deciding the race order throughout the afternoon. There aren't too many opportunities to pass on that track. So a lot of it will be coming to uh, tire strategy and pit stops and who tries to undercut or overcut who and, and things like that. And we've seen that over one lap that there is nobody quicker than Lewis Hamilton. What he did at Silverstone a couple of weeks ago in that qualifying lap was absolutely stunning. I mean, he he does it time and time again. It's just that uh, when when you think that 
oh, well, this weekend, Lewis just, he can't keep this up forever. He goes out and just smashes records and just throws it down. And uh, he, he does it time and time again. So if you think that uh, Lewis Hamilton has his car set up uh, correctly, which why wouldn't he? And uh, he's able to put in one of those impressive qualifying laps and take pole position. You have to think that uh, he's going to have a pretty good opportunity to win that race. And so based on the form that we've seen between, Mc- or sorry, not McLaren, but Ferrari and Mercedes over the past four or five races, I would have to, if, if I'm putting money on it, I'm saying that it's a silver car on the top step, uh, step of the podium. And I think it's probably going to be Lewis Hamilton. Yeah, I have to agree with you for Hungary, absolutely, because uh, unless there's a crash, an accident, something that goes awry off the start, I think we'll see a, a, a silver arrow dominance this weekend. Yeah, and the other thing is, too, is that being always held in the summer, and I think there's only ever been one rainy race at the Hungora Ring. And so also qualifying is important. It's not only how far up the, like where you are on the grid. Obviously, if you have pole position, that's great. But if you're on the inside of the track, that track is dusty. It doesn't get used very often throughout the year. So there's not a lot of rubber on it. The the times actually increase and get better the later in each session, just as they get more grip on the track. But also if you get on that dusty side for the start, that's also going to make it uh, tough as well. So, I mean, if you don't nab that pole position, you're starting in second or fourth or sixth or whatever, you're on the inside of the track, that's going to make it uh, difficult as well. And uh, it, it's going to be quite the uh, important race. I, I think that what we see this Sunday in Hungary, I think will give us a good indication of uh, how the, the championship might go for the rest of the year. Yeah, I agree. All right, Mike, I think it's time. It's time to talk about... Formula E on Scuderia F1. Formula E, Mark. A lot of news this week, actually, and breaking news today. As we we're actually recording this, I received an email from Formula E and Porsche themselves saying, uh, well, saying that Porsche will be joining Formula E in 2019-2020. So in the sixth season of Formula E's existence, they are uh, quitting World Endurance Championship. They are quitting Endurance Racing and Le Mans to uh, focus on Formula E. And that news goes to the same kind of news earlier this week where Mercedes themselves announced that they will enter Formula E in the exact same season, 2019-2020. That's on top of BMW as well. Yeah, it's getting uh, a lot of great manufacturers now in Formula E. It's very interesting too. I mean, it, it seems like all of a sudden that this is being becoming the go-to series for all these different manufacturers. And we were talking about it before we actually started recording the episode is before too long, Ferrari might be one of the big racing marks that's on the outside looking in in Formula E, which uh, it, it seems kind of strange. I mean, you don't really think of Ferrari as uh, a car manufacturer that would be interested in a series like that. But who knows, as time goes on, maybe it's it's going to be a situation where Ferrari might rethink whether or not they want to participate. You know what, too? Other manufacturers might come in, and that's a purely speculation on my part right now. Volvo has been in the news in the last few months saying they will literally convert the entire production of cars over the next two decades into fully electric. Well, if you want to showcase your electric capabilities, maybe you want to race an electric series right down the road. So there will be other manufacturers making these steps. But now, just what we're talking about now, Jaguar, Porsche, Mercedes, Audi, Renault, and Come, there's going to be more. Like Toyota is going to be the last one left in LMP1, so I wouldn't be surprised if they actually quit WEC as well, and I wouldn't be surprised if Toyota makes the jump to Formula E in probably for 2019-2022. It's fascinating when you look at how quickly the series is actually growing. I mean, it's only been around for a couple of years, but when when you look at how fast and how quickly not only the technology is changing, but the the, the teams that are there, the teams that are coming, the drivers that are there, it's it's quite the series to keep uh, an eye on and follow. And and I I, I must admit that uh, when it comes to motor racing, uh, I'm I'm very much focused on Formula One. I do cast a glance and and, and follow Le Mans and in. 
Indy and some of like the the, the bigger races and some of the other series. But uh, Formula E to this point has been one that I really haven't looked at very, very much. But they're making it harder and harder to ignore, obviously, as each passing week and month and year goes by that uh, when you hear news like this and you hear that the, the calendar is getting expanded. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, the Montreal e is the first uh, edition of that uh, that's coming up this weekend. It's definitely it seems to be a series that's going big places and it's getting there awfully quickly. Well, it has the backing of, of manufacturers, the FIA itself, and it sees itself as bigger than just about racing. It sees itself as a way to promote an electric vehicle that could be maybe the salvation of humanity one day, if you want to use those terms. Because one day we won't have any more fuel to put in cars and we'll need other ways to transport themselves and hopefully technology will catch up in the right amount of time where we have performance electric cars very soon. And that's yeah. one of the kind of outspoken goal of Formula E is to develop some part of electric cars that can help having more cost-effective cars and not necessarily having, uh, this is timely, a Tesla 3 that will put you back a few hundred thousand. Maybe we'll have like a cheap electric car that can everybody can afford and maybe uh, Formula E is part of that equation. And as well as just, it's a sport, right? We love motorsport and more. it's a reflection of society. And one day we will have to decide if we really need to waste all that fuel with all the motorsports all across the board. Maybe the way to go is having motorsport with no fuel, like Formula E. So, no, I think it does bring a lot of positive, and yes, there's a lot of negative, too, if you're looking at the outcry in different cities where uh, some residents are not happy because the track is right in front of their houses. And uh, in Montreal, it's difficult to see the track if you don't have a ticket. It's built in a way to, that you need to buy a ticket to actually attend the race and not like in New York where you could just stand on the side of it and just watch it. So there's a lot of complaints on one side, but I do feel for, for the greater cause, Formula E is very important. And I'm really looking forward to on the sporting side of things too, because Sebastian Buemi, only 10 points ahead of Lucas de Grassi in the fight for the championship. It's a double race, qualifying, well, practice, qualifying, and race on the same day, Saturday. Same for Sunday. A lot of points at stake. Both the drivers in the Constructors' Championship are up for grabs. Yes, Renault Edams has advantage on both, but I still feel Audi has advantage. So it's an inci- a very exciting track, by the way, Mark. The drivers were saying, and uh, well, you can follow me on Twitter at Kev Laramie and Scuderia F1 as well and the feed everywhere because we'll have special coverage. I will be covering the event. I am accredited media for Formula E race, so we'll have special behind the scene look and we'll get to know more. But but this really is shaping up to be like a season ending race to remember and like a decisive one too. Like we have no clue who's gonna win heading into the race this weekend. Well, tell us a little bit uh, about the circuit, uh, Kevin. Obviously, uh, Montreal is your hometown, and uh, I'm looking at a map of the circuit. I, I mean, there's a, a couple of, uh, well, several 90-degree corners, but uh, several long straightaways, and it, it looks like a, a very well-laid-out track. Uh, what, what can you tell us about it? What's really interesting is when it goes back on um, André Lévesque, and then you have the chicane just before the uh, Radio Canada Tower. And it's kind of like two chicanes. So it's kind of like a bus stop chicane that we call. And they almost come in there at peak velocity for their car, which is almost 220 kilometers an hour. And they have to do two quick turns. And there will be opportunities to overtake there. But it's so narrow. And the second turn of that bus stop type of chicane comes so quickly that if you miss that apex of the first turn, while you're trying to overtake, you'll end up in the wall, and that could be really costly. So, because it's a double double round, right? There's two races. You kind of need to be conservative, too. Because even if you're third in the championship, a lot of points at stake. And if the guy's unlucky on the first day and you rack up a lot of points, whatever could happen the next day, you never know. So, and there's that aspect to it. There's uh, The pavement will be pristine, it's all been redone for this race, so that's not going to be an issue. But I really feel that the pit exit is very tight, so we might see trouble at the start, at the first turn, or 
when they actually change the cars mid-race. Yeah, because that uh, turn one is more than a 90 degree turn. It looks like it's over well over 100, maybe 110 degrees and then sort of dog legs back towards the left uh, going down into turn two, which is another 90 degree turn. And then sort of about a third of the way, half of the way down is where the pit lane rejoins the track. So that should be uh, quite uh, an interesting uh, part of the circuit uh, to watch. So what's the, the schedule of events for the for the next couple of days, Kevin? All right, I have it right in front of me. Well, tomorrow, or as you are listening to this Friday, it starts. And there's some uh, a driver track walk at 9.30, and there's some license control, mandatory media activity, so a scrum in the media pen with the drivers from 12 to 1 p.m. There's going to be a shakedown, some red card test, driver's briefing, and then the cars are under pack fermé at 11 p.m. Friday. Then the action actually starts on Saturday, open to the public with tickets as well. You can still get tickets. It starts at 7 a.m., track opens, there's an expansion lap, they check everything, they make a safety car exercise, then the actual practice starts at 8. First non-qualifying practice, there's a second qualifying practice. Then at noon, qualifying start with group 1, group 2, 3, and 4. They're by group, and then you have for the pole for the fastest ones, at 12.45, at 1 p.m., we know who is starting first. So then there's a little break. Everybody's going out for lunch. And there's a back fermé with the cars from 1 to 1.35 during inspection. Driver parade. Then it actually starts the race at uh, 4.03. The race starts. On Saturday, if I'm going to check for sure. Uh, yes, 4.03. The race starts 35 laps, around an hour. So, scheduled podium ceremony for the Saturday at 5.05 p.m. So, I'll be there getting some uh, uh, non-moving images, which I'm allowed to do. Uh, the images cannot <laughs> be moving. So, it will be straight pictures of some ceremony. It will get the audio as well, the commentary post-race of course, and that's one of the reasons why we're doing this, and we will have some special uh, post-race shows that I will be recording live from the circuit. So follow me on Twitter, and especially on Facebook, like Scuderia F1 page on Facebook, and my personal one, facebook.com slash Kevin Laramie, and uh, you'll get some behind-the-scenes look at the activity. But yes, that's the schedule you need to remember, both Saturday and Sunday, it opens at 7, qualifying are at noon, race at 4. And it's going to be a very, very busy week for you uh, because not only are you going to be at the EPRI, but then uh, shortly thereafter, you're going down to Chicago for the MLS All-Star Game. So <laughs> you've got your work cut out for you for the living next six the or dream. seven days. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Dream, I'm leaving Monday morning thanks to Passion Soccer Boutique to Chicago to cover the Major League Soccer All-Star Game. I am excited, but uh, it still seems so far away because right before that, I have Formula E. Absolutely. So I think that's uh, pretty much that uh, we have for everything of this episode of uh, Scuderia F1. Kevin, uh, I think you've given everybody a heads up uh, where they can uh, find you online, but uh, where else can they follow and uh, subscribe to the shows on the network? Sports Podcasting Network on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Store, anywhere you get your podcast and look for special coverage this weekend of the Montreal E-Pre, the decisive round 11 and 12 of the 2016-17 Formula E season. We will have a champion in the streets of Montreal on Sunday, and you will hear that champion this weekend on the network. Very cool. And of course, you can follow this show on Twitter at Scuderia F1. And that's it. That's a wrap. We will catch you guys again very shortly with all our Montreal e pre news, the Hungarian Grand Prix review, and everything else that happens in between. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and we'll catch you again soon. Listening to the Scuderia F1 podcast. If you want to get the show notes for this episode, then head over to ScuderiaF1Pod.com. Want to get in touch with us? Then email us at ScuderiaF1Pod at gmail.com. You were listening to SPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Visit us 
sportspodcastingnetwork.com.